Hey, welcome back to Zombie Tactics. The title of the video today, uh, kind of a long one, and a warning in advance on that. You can probably see down there in the little window how long the video is. But I think the payoff's worth it, so hang with me on this. The title of the video is Racism, Bigotry, and Bullets. And uh, you'll, it'll become clear why that is the, the topic in a second here. But I want to start out by kind of doing just a little bit of talk about the American system of government and how we're supposed to kind of think about things in context. Now, when the founding of this country came about and the, the, the Declaration of Independence was written, Thomas Jefferson put in there some very important language about what the purpose of government is. Now, in the mind of the founders, because they all, you know, signed their little name to that Declaration of Independence document that pretty much meant they were traitors against Great Britain and, you know, put their lives on the line for it, they really meant those words. Uh, he said the following. He said that, that people have certain unalienable rights. You've heard this over and over. Chief among them, meaning these are not the only ones, I'm only giving you a few of them, but these are some of the big ones. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And there's language in there to the effect that the only legitimate purpose of government in the minds of the founders, and certainly in the mind of Thomas Jefferson, the only legitimate purpose of government, and this is a radical idea at the time that it was written, only legitimate purpose of government is to secure the rights of the citizens. That's it. There's no other legitimate purpose of government. And if you've got a government based on something else, it's an illegitimate government. Now that's funny. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. If you have a right to your life, that means you have the right to defend it. And it's silly to talk about the right to defend your life unless you have the means to do so using whatever tools are common to the era that you're born in. Okay? So we kind of Fast forward a little bit and we get to the Constitutional Convention. We already had the Civil, not the Civil War, we had the War for Independence, the American Revolutionary War. We had the Articles of Confederation for a while. That didn't really work, work out very well. So we convened a Constitutional Convention. We started this thing and we came up with this thing called the Constitution of the United States. Now the Constitution of the United States is another radical document because unlike every other government that had existed up to that point on, on the face of the planet, it made a, a weird assumption. It said instead of the way every other government on the face of the planet has been instituted before, which says that the government has absolute power and the people have whatever powers and rights and privileges that the government gives them, we're flipping that on its head. All power is with the people, and the government only has the rights that the people give it. And part of the purpose of this document, of this constitution, is we're going to lay out some things that the government can do. And actually, I said that wrong. We're not going to lay out some things that the government can do. Can do. We're going to lay out the only things that the government's supposed to do. And that's what the Constitution is. It's the concept of enumerated powers, meaning the government gets to do the things that we enumerate in this document and no other things. Everything else is left to the states or to the people. Really important concept, really radical compared to the idea before that like the divine right of kings and all power rests with the government and blah, blah, blah. Now, they felt so serious about this that they also did another thing, that even though they'd just written a document that said, hey, we're going to write down all the things that the government gets to do, and the government doesn't get to do any other things but these things, they turned around and they said, we're going to pass something. We're going to pass these ten amendments to the Constitution. These ten amendments to the Constitution, which, by the way, we collectively refer to as the Bill of Rights, they're not the Bill of Suggestions. They're not the Bill of Really Good Ideas that you can just do away with whenever you want to. We, we just finished writing a document, the Constitution, that says that these are the only things that the government can do. And then, almost to make it clear, they turn around and they write these ten amendments that say, oh, oh, and by the way, here's specifically a bunch of stuff the government cannot do because the people have these other rights. We're going to enumerate some more rights of the people. Now, these aren't all of them. But we're going to talk about some more things that the people have the right to do. They have the right to free speech. You can't pass a law against that. They have a right to peaceably assemble and redress the government for their, you know, uh, you know to a, a, whatever. They have the right to complain against the government, <laughs> to put it in common terms. You can have whatever religion you want. You can print whatever you want. You can print stuff even critical of the government. You can't be forced, like every other government before did, you can't be forced by the police to testify against yourself. In other words, they can't force you to f sign a convention, a, a confession to a crime. You have the right to keep and bear 
arms. Keep meaning you have the right to own them, and they're mine. They're my property. And bear the meaning you get to keep them, you get to carry them around with you. And the government's not supposed to infringe upon that. So we already said there's the government can only do the things that are in the Constitution. And then we passed the Bill of Rights and said, here's some specific things where the government's not supposed to be able to mess with you at all. They were that clear about it. And of course, that's gotten fuzzied up over time and bad Supreme Court decisions and a couple of good decisions lately, specifically having to do with the Second Amendment, which is what I'm talking about here, because, again, the topic of the video is, uh, what is it? Racism, bigotry, and bullets. We're going to put it the other way around. Bigotry, racism, and bullets. I think it's racism, bigotry, and bullets. Well, how does this all fit together? Well, the second thing we need to do, I'm six minutes into the video here, uh, I can see on the camera, I needed to define the term for you, racism. Some people will say, they'll use this following equation, racism equals race plus power equals racism. And the idea there, and this is kind of the reason I don't like it, it's faulty logic because it says that whenever one race is predominantly the power structure of a nation, that it's inherently racist. That doesn't necessarily make sense. And you, the other thing about it is that you only find that it's applied to the United States of America. It's never applied to some other country where it's predominantly, you know, a non-white population. And they say, oh, the predominantly non-white population is inherently racist because that's who everybody in government is, you know. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way there. Um, so it's kind of faulty logic, but that's one way that people take a look at it. Um, however, I kind of look at it as this way. There's a thing called bigotry, and bigotry is just whenever you have an attitude about somebody based solely on the color of their skin or the shape of their eyes or, you know, whatever. So if you take a look at somebody over there and your assumption is just by taking a look at them, you say, oh, they got, you know, a different shape of eye. That must mean they're great at math. <laughs> or you take a look at somebody and they talk like this, so you just assume that they must be an engineer. Okay. Or you take a look at somebody over there and they've got beautiful chocolate brown skin, so you're assuming they're really good dancers. That is bigotry because all you're doing, you don't know anything about this person. You haven't seen how they dance. You haven't seen them do engineering. You, haven't, you don't even know if they can balance their checkbook, but you're assuming that just based on the color of their skin or the shape of their eye or the accent that they have that reveals what country that they came from. Okay, that's bigotry. Now to me, racism is when you start empowering or disempowering people based upon those kinds of bigoted notions. When you start saying things like, hmm, I got 10 guys to hire for this job. It requires a lot of mathematics. I think I'm going to go with the Asian guy. Oh, no, no, we can't have the, uh, can't have the white guy or the brown skin guy. Oh, no, no, they, they, those people are not good at that kind of thing. But, you know, I need to write a jingle for the commercial, so I'm thinking that guy over there has got a great sense of rhythm. Now, see, that's, that is taking your power as a person, and you are applying it in a bigoted fashion, and that is racism. Now, individual racism like that is a bad thing, and I don't think you're ever going to be able to, to completely eliminate that. People are going to make those kinds of stupid decisions, and you know what? They reap the uh, all the ills that comes out of that. Anybody who makes a decision on who they're going to hire based on that kind of stupidity is going to end up hiring the wrong people, and they're going to go out of business, and good that they go out of business. Um, for being that stupid. Stupid has a price, stupid ought to hurt. But when we, as a, as a body of people, corporately, collectively, we begin to apply that kind of power based on skin color and things like that, that's when you can say that we have racist laws or racist policies of governance. Now the thing that I want to bring to your attention is the following. Every single gun control law, every law designed to limit your rights to own arms, to keep them and to bear them, to use them for your self-defense or even things like target practice and hunting. And you know that's not primarily the focus of my channel, but that's people's rights as well. Those are the rights that people have. Those are one of the legitimate uses that they can have for guns or sports shooting or whatever you want to do. Every law to limit, to infringe, to use the constitutional language, against your right to keep, meaning have, and bear, meaning carry them around with you, guns, has its roots in racist policies and racist thoughts and bigoted ideas. You can go back as far as you want. Now, I'm gonna, I, I could talk about other countries for a minute, but I always think that that's poor form 
to gripe about somebody else's country. I'm going to talk about the United States of America because that's where I live. I'm going to talk about the state of California because that's the state that I live in. And I'm going to talk about Placer County a little bit because that's the county that I live in. If you live in a different county in California, if you live in a different country or whatever, understand, I'm just talking about this because this is what I know the best. This probably applies to your state. I know that in some cases it actually applies to your country or it applies to your county. But everywhere you look around the world, where there is a law to limit people's right to keep and bear arms, and specifically here in the United States, it is always based on bigoted and racist notions. You can go back before the founding of this country, so we're going to, I guess, hit Britain a little bit here, um, <laughs> breaking my own rules, and the first laws that were passed, well, in France, too, were to keep guns out of the hands of people like you couldn't sell them to Indians, you couldn't sell them to slaves, you couldn't let slaves have them except on, under certain circumstances. Well, what did that do? That's racist. You, oh, you, the, the Indians can't have guns. Oh, uh, the, the brown skin people, the, the black folks, the folks that we brought over here from Africa, oh, no, no, they can't have guns. And by the way, in the case of the Indians, most of those weren't slaves, so these are free people running around. You're just saying, oh, no, no, you can't have guns. Can't have the red guys having guns. No, no, no. Because you know what happens with them in Firewater. And you can't have, you know, the brown skinned people over there, you can't have them because, you know, they're childlike and simple in their mentality and they're prone to violence. And that would, that would, have, been the, that would have been the argument, something like that. And so the French and the British, right off the bat, had laws against folks, with, uh, with, with folks from Africa, black skinned people, and red skinned people from having firearms. And this goes on and on and on. Everywhere in the country where you find out a law that crops up that says, well, you got to sign a special paper here, or you got to have special permission, or you got to pay a tax, or you got to get a, a special card, or a special ID, or something, it doesn't matter where you go. It all has its race. It all has its foundations based in bigoted thoughts. And the language, at least initially, is very clear. Oh, we're trying to keep the guns out of the hands of the Chinese. Uh, here in California, oh, we're trying to keep the hands out of the out of the out of the out of the dockies hands. You know, you can't have the dockies having guns. You know that kind of thing. Oh, we're going to keep the the guns out of the Italians' hands. We're going to keep the guns out of the Irish hands because you know how those people are. And in some cases, those aren't even races. I mean, you know, Irish people are white people. <laughs> you know, but if they sound like this, then you're not supposed to be able to give them a gun because I guess they're going to go crazy on. St. Patrick's Day or something like that. Every single law. Now you might think, well, it's gotten better over time, hasn't it? Hasn't? I mean, we don't have racist gun laws today, do we? Well, let's go back to that idea of how you pass laws and they only affect a particular group of people. Now, we've had a court case after court case that show that if you pass a law and it kind of looks on its face like, well, it's not trying to affect everybody, but it really, I mean, it's not trying to affect a one particular group of people. It's written against everybody, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, um, it disproportionately affects a certain group of people. Now, I'll be silly about this. Say we passed a law that, you know, people that have cars that do this going down the road, we're going to pass a law against that. And it's not about safety, because we phony up some safety things, and it's not about anything else. We can't show any difference in the way that cars that go like that down the road have that kind of equipment. Uh, are there any less safe or anything like that? We would say to ourselves, you know what? That is targeting a certain part of the population, racially speaking, that likes to do that kind of thing with their cars because it's, you know, the way that certain people want to do things with their cars. That'd be a racist law, right? Because it's just targeting one group of people. If we started saying, uh, if we started regulating things like what kind of clothing you can wear, I mean, you know, so long as it's basically decent or whatever, we'd start saying that because we'd start finding out that because of the various cultures and subcultures and this kind of thing and the big melting pot that is America, that if you start regulating clothing, you'd find out that when you say, oh no, you can't wear those kind of pants, you can't wear them that low, because <laughs> we think it's stupid. I think it's dumb that people wear their pants halfway down their ankles, but it's not something you make a law about. If you make a law about it, that's racist because it's only affecting a certain part of the population who happens to be of a, a member of a certain race. Or even if it's not only affecting them, it's disproportionately affecting them, meaning that it's mostly about them, even though you're trying to make it sound like, well, you know, it's a safety issue or we just don't, you know, people shouldn't wear their clothing that way, you know, that kind of thing. 
as long as it's not common decency or safety or spreading disease or something, you know, America is kind of a wild, wild, wide open place, and it's supposed to be. That's kind of the idea. So let's get back to gun laws. All of these laws were passed initially to keep the guns out of people's hands. Non-white people. We can't have the non-white people having the guns, you know what I mean? Every single law. Well, today we have the same kind of laws, believe it or not. It's just they don't go by that kind of thing. You take a look at certain counties in California, for instance. Like, for instance, I live in Placer County. Placer County, pretty easy to get a, a, a concealed carry permit. Uh, not as easy as some other counties. Sacramento is a county that's uh, referred to as a shall issue county, and that means you sign up for your permit. You got to do a little bit of training in California, but it's not a real big deal. You sign up for your permit, you do your training, unless there's some reason you got some kind of criminal record or you're you're, you're a nutcase or something. Um, you're going to get your permit. Shall issue meaning unless we can show a really good reason. You're going to get your permit. Other counties in California are, well, you've got to show a halfway good reason. Plaster's kind of that way. Some counties in California are, you got to show a really freaking good reason before we're going to give you a concealed carry permit, buddy. Uh, some counties are what, what we refer to as no issue. That would be like Marin County, I believe, uh, Los Angeles County, the county and city of San Francisco. Now... What can you find out about a couple of these places like San Francisco and Los Angeles and that whole area there? Hmm. A lot of minority populations there, huh? A lot of a lot of people from Mexico down in Southern California. Hmm. A lot of people that are black and, and, and Asian and all kinds of things in in you know in, in, in San Francisco or in Alameda County. Oh, well, that's where all the big gun control laws are. Those are all the places where you just about cannot get a gun and, and have the right to use it, uh, have the right to carry it on your person concealed. You can't get a concealed carry permit there at all in some cases. The places where all the non-white populations are greater than they are other places in the state. Now, the crazy part about that is this. See, I'm in Placer County. I can get a concealed carry permit. A lot of the areas in, in, in California, the ones that are predominantly white, you can get a permit there. And since the, the permit's good statewide, I can get my CCW permit, and I can grab my Glock, and I can stick it in my pocket, and I can go to San Francisco, and it's completely legal for me to carry a gun there, concealed. I can get my concealed carry permit, and I go down to Los Angeles County, and I'm walking along. And I'm the white guy, and look, there's a brown guy. He can't have a permit. <laughs> oh, look, there's a Chinese guy. He can't have a gun. Oh, look, there's a Mexican guy. He can't have a gun. So what it means is the white guy gets a privilege in California that these people that live in these other areas don't have. Now, you could pretend it's not based upon race, but I, I dare you to tell me why if it's not race. That that's the case because these are the these are the parts of the the, the state and, and this is nationwide by the way these are the parts of the state where you'd think common ordinary law-abiding citizens if anybody has a reason to want to have a gun to protect themselves my god it's these areas the high crime areas and the problem isn't law-abiding black folks and 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 mexican folks and chinese and japanese and people from korea and whatever country around the world there's no problem with those folks CCW holders aren't out committing crimes. The, the statistics show this clearly. And frankly, if you want to, uh, if you want to, uh, you know, go even further, John Lott's work shows conclusively that one of two things are the case: the places in the country where you can get a concealed carry permit easy, crime either is not affected by that at all, meaning crime doesn't go up just because normal, ordinary, law-abiding citizens have guns, and in most cases, crime actually goes down. Because common, ordinary, everyday citizens can get something like this, or something smaller, or something bigger. It's up to them, not up to me, and not up to the government, and carry it for their self-protection. This Glock in my hands will never be an instrument of crime. Ever. I'm 52 years old. I've never committed a, a, a crime. I've never been involved in a violent incident. Well, 
I've been attacked four times, but I've never been I've never been the instigator of a violent incident. Okay? This gun is not a, a weapon of of violence in my hands. It is a device for my self defense and nothing else. Period. And that's exactly what it would be in the hands of the vast majority of, of people who are black, brown, red, yellow, whatever color you want to ascribe to it, whatever country they come from, whatever kind of funny accent they talk with. Most people are normal. Most people are not criminals. And frankly, most criminals, well, criminals, they don't. They don't go into a gun store, buy a brand new gun, and then go get a CCW permit. It doesn't work that way. They just get a gun on the street wherever they can, and they don't care which one it is. They just got to get themselves a GAT. They got to get themselves a Roscoe. They got to get themselves that thing. They're going to pay whatever cheap amount of money they can get, and that's it. You look around all the places in the country where it's mostly white people, and there's hardly any crime. That's all the places you can get guns. That kind of tells you a story. One of them is, huh, why do all the white people get guns and all the black people can't get guns, or whatever other color? And the second thing is, hey, they don't have any crime in those cities, despite the fact that some of those cities are as large as these other large cities. Huh. They don't have any crime in those cities, and everybody's able to get a gun. I guess guns aren't the problem. Well, then why can't you get a gun in Chicago? I don't know. Maybe it's got something to do with the fact that the people in power are racist, and they don't want guns in the hands of people of color. Because there's more people of color in Chicago than there are in other areas of the country where you can get a gun easily and get a concealed carry permit easily. Hmm, Washington, D.C., the largest black population, the largest minority population in the United States of America, the capital of the very nation, the seat of government that is supposed to be doing nothing other than protecting the rights of the citizens. Oh no, those are the, um, among the most restrictive gun laws in the nations. I, I guess only white people have a right to, to self-defense. I guess only white people have the right to the, the Second Amendment rights. Only white people have the right to carry this gun, not as a weapon of violence, but as a means of defending themselves against those who would do them harm. Maybe it's only the cities in this country that, that have a bunch of non-white people in where we're going to tolerate all the crime while we're cutting back on police services and there's corruption in the government. You see, this stuff is racist. And I want to tell you how they explain this stuff. Here in California, we've been, uh, we've been writing letters to our senators, two senators, Boxer and Feinstein, who are on that other side of the fence. They love these racist laws. And we write them laws because there's this thing being considered calling, called uh, national reciprocity for concealed carry permits. And it goes like this. It says, if you have a permit in your state, that permit is like a driver's license. It's good everywhere. So if you get a permit in Nevada, it's good in California. You get a permit in California, it's good in Nevada. You get a permit in Arizona, it's good all over the country. Just like a driver's license. Well, why shouldn't that be the case? This is the same gun, whether I'm holding it here in Northern California, or whether I'm holding it in Nevada, or whether I'm holding it in Florida, and the same thing, they're going to buy the same Glock over in Florida, and when they travel to California, it's not all of a sudden like, oh, there's no crime in California, so you don't need one here, which wouldn't be the point anyway. So why not have it be the same as, as a, a driver's license or anything else that we recognize, that whole full faith and credit clause and the whole equal protection under the law uh, business that we talk about, where you're supposed to have the same rights throughout the United States, particularly the big ones like like freedom of speech and the right to keep and bear arms. Well, you'll get a nice form letter back from Senator Boxer, for instance, saying that, like, I'm sympathetic to your position, but I just think that this is a state's rights issue. And I think that the same laws that apply to rural and suburban populations don't really have the same... Uh, we shouldn't have the same laws applying to urban populations when it comes to firearms. Hmm, rural areas... That's code for white, if you ask me. Suburban, hmm, that's code for upscale white populations, if you ask me. Urban, wow, whenever you mention urban in any other context, people will tell you plainly, oh, that's code word for minorities. So you don't think the same laws should apply allowing people to have guns who are urban types that are rural or suburban types. In other words, you don't want 
the people of color who live in the urban areas predominantly to have the same rights that the people who are white have. There's no other excuse for this. It's, it's, it's like they're not even really trying to dress it up. Every gun law in this country today is designed to do one thing and one thing only. It's the only thing that it can do is keep guns out of the hands of law-abiding citizens. Why? Because those are the only people that are going to buy the law, abide the law. Whether my skin is as lily white as it is, or whether it's brown, or ha I have a different shape of eyes, or I talk with a funny accent, or I'm taller or shorter or anything, I'm a human being for Pete's sake, and the purpose of the government is to protect my rights. And you want to know what? You are too, regardless of whether your skin is this color or some other color. When they say, ooh, we don't want those urban people having the right to have a gun, what they're really saying is, we don't really think that black people or Mexicans ought to be able to have a gun. And there really isn't any other way to explain it. If there was any other law that, that, that predominantly affected these parts of our population, which gun laws do, they disproportionately affect urban and minority populations much greater than they affect the white population in this country. Any other law, we'd say it's racist on its face. So my conclusion that in this case is that it's racist on its face as well. And those of you who are minorities who are watching this video and you're watching a white guy preach to you about this, understand this. These laws are designed to keep guns out of your hands and they are designed by people who want you to be nothing more than a subject of the state where everything that in your life is controlled in one way or another by the power establishment. I know that sounds kind of radical language or whatever. They don't want you to be free. They don't want you to have the freedom to think for yourself. They don't want you to have the freedom to do anything as trivial as buying a large soda for Pete's sake on your own. What makes you think, and by the way, those laws tend to get get uh, passed in, in areas that are predominantly larger minority populations too. Oh no, you can't trust the minority people to make good decisions about what they're going to have, you know, with their hamburger. <laughs> so uh, that's my rant against these laws, and this is why we have to oppose them. One of the reasons why we have to oppose them. They deprive everybody of their rights, but they deprive minorities more of their rights than everybody else, and those of you who are of a different color need to oppose them strenuously. Uh, that's Zombie Tactics for today, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.